we're going to take a look at the subject of training to be prophets. Now it's kind of following along this, this whole theme that we've been looking at of kings and priests, and you might wonder, well, where does prophets fit into this? And really, the prophets fit into this in the sense that this becomes almost a practical outworking of the kings and priests themselves, because the prophets are more or less similar to both of them. They were accompanying the priests, they accompanied the prophets, they were involved in the things that were going on. Now, we've been looking at this whole subject of kings and priests and how we can be like them. And um, when we look at Moses, who was of the Levites, right? He was one of that number. He was also a prophet. So let's just take a look. If we go back to Exodus chapter 6, and we see here where we are in this whole scheme of things. In Exodus chapter 6, in verse 28, we find that Moses is given this commission. It came to pass on that day when Yahweh spake to Moses in the land of Egypt, that Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, I am Yahweh, speak thou to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto you. So Moses, as a Levite, is basically sent out to be the messenger of God. Now he's not so sure about his commission. In fact, he says to God, he says, Before Yahweh, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How shall, I, uh, how shall Pharaoh hearken to me? So Moses felt that he was really not up to the task. He was not qualified for this job. And perhaps sometimes we feel the same way. But listen to what God has to say to Moses. Because he says to him, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of this land. So here we have the picture that Moses was going to become like a, a god to Pharaoh. He was going to become a mighty one in that sense. But what he was supposed to do was to speak all that he was commanded of by Yahweh, and um, the prophet was going to be Aaron. He was going to be the messenger or the spokesperson. And the idea of a prophet is literally that idea of an authorized spokesperson, and the word is rooted in the idea of somebody who bubbles up. Now, he says that he felt inadequate. He's not the only prophet that would say this. In fact, if we come over to Isaiah, we find that Isaiah also feels that he's not quite up to the job that is commissioned to him. So Isaiah, in chapter 6, sees a great vision of the Lord. It's actually a vision of the kingdom age. He sees the Lord lifted up in his, in his temple. It's actually the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's kind of transported in vision to the time of the kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 6, after seeing this vision, he says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of hosts. So he sees this great vision. He sees the king. He sees the Lord's representative, the one who is he who will be mighty ones. And he says, I'm not cut out for this job. And sometimes that's the way we feel when it comes to the kingdom. We feel like we just don't deserve to be there. But what happens is, is that one of the seraphims flies, having a live coal in his hand taken from the altar, and he lays it on Isaiah's mouth and says, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. So Isaiah is cleansed by God, and we can't cleanse ourselves. This is something basically that God has to do ultimately. And he's then made fit for the job. I remember we were talking yesterday, but we need to engage in that process about our vessels. We need to make sure our vessels are clean as they can be, so they're fit for the master's use. And now Isaiah is basically equipped for this job, and he then is given this question. So after this, in verse 8, uh, he hears the voice of, of the Lord, or Adonai, saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? So here's the question, young people. And brothers and sisters, when it comes to being kings and priests and prophets, God needs help because he can't complete his purpose on the earth without people engaged in this process. And so he says, who will send and who will go for us? And this is really envisioned the Lord Jesus Christ asking Isaiah this question. And having been brought into covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, having been made clean, he turns around and he says, then said I, here am I, send me. So that has to be what we, we look at in our own lives, is that if God has made us fit, then there is a job for us to do. 
And Isaiah recognizes his inadequacy. He realizes he's not good enough. God cleanses him. The call comes, and Isaiah volunteers. And so he says, here am I, send me. And it's interesting because prophets were people who were sent by Yahweh to do a job. Now, that may ring true when you look through to the New Testament and you say, well, there was other people who were also sent by Yahweh to do a job. Except they were actually sent this time through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, the 12 disciples, that is, <clears throat> Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not to the way of the Gentiles, the city of the Samaritans, enter not, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have you received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass nor uh, in your purses, and so on and so forth. But the apostles, or the, the disciples, are sent forth, right? The word apostle actually means one who is sent. So just like the prophets, they were sent, and they were to go and preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they had freely received the benefits that the Lord had given them, so they were to freely give. And just like we have freely been given the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, we have to also freely give it out. And... They didn't need to have a certain amount of money in their bank account. They didn't need to reach a certain financial status, get all their schooling and, and degree and everything in order. Um, he said, never mind about the money. Never mind about your personal you know, financial status or your security. Get on with the job. And that's the same thing with us. We have to have that, that real uh, mindset of here am I, send me. Now let's come back to Jeremiah. Come back to Jeremiah chapter 1 because he is, is one of the prophets that probably... Um, you know, we have the most about his personal life, really, I think, as far as prophets go. Um, Elijah is just a couple of chapters. Um, but Jeremiah, we have a, a great deal that's told about us and, and what, or told to us about what goes on. Daniel is a fair amount of detail, but he's only got a few chapters, 12. Uh, Jeremiah is quite a lot. There's a quite a amount about uh, Isaiah as well and his family. But Jeremiah kind of is very interesting because... Um, we see his whole process of when he's picked to write the way through to, to the end of the captivity of Israel. So we read in, um, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, in at verse 4, Then the word of Yahweh came unto, say, in, unto me, saying, Behold, I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Sorry, I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, I ordain thee to be a prophet to the nations. Now, it's interesting here that Jeremiah had been chosen from the womb. Before he made a choice himself, God chose him. And in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ says to us, look, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. He went and picked the disciple, and he has picked us, and he has shared with us the word. We didn't choose him. He found a way to us and has given us the word, whether we've grown up in the truth, whether we've been introduced through friends or people that we know, he has picked us, and it's up to us then to respond to that call. He says, I sanctify thee. And that's that same word, to set apart, to hallow, to dedicate, or to devote something. And then he says, I ordained thee to the, to the nations, right, as, as a prophet. Now, the word ordained is interesting. It's actually the Hebrew word Nathan. Now, you might know that Nathan is the word to gift something, or to bestow, or to give a gift. So my name is Jonathan, Yonathan, which basically is the idea of Yahweh's gift. Um, now you look at the Nethanims. You've heard of Nethanims in the Bible. Uh, Numbers chapter 3 and verse 9. The Nethanims were the ones who were given to uh, Aaron to do the service of the tabernacle. They were the gifted ones, right? They were given by God. And they come up in, in uh, Ezra chapter 8 and verse 20 as well. The Nethanims who David appointed for the service of the Levites. So these are all people that were given by God to a specific job. And Jeremiah was the gift of God to the nation of Israel, to the nations around about. Now, he might not have really felt that much like a special gift, especially with what happened to him. And I'm sure, you know, the king of Israel didn't think that Jeremiah was a gift that God had given to him. In fact, we know he didn't. He locked him up in prison. But Jeremiah himself didn't feel up to this job. He said, look, 
Lord Yahweh, behold, I cannot speak. I'm just a kid. I'm just a child, which tells you he must have started out fairly young in this commission. And, uh, and sometimes perhaps that's how we feel. We're too young for this job. You know, like we're talking about kings and priests and whatever. How can we possibly do this? Well, that's how Jeremiah felt. He says, I'm just, I'm not up to this commission. I'm not up to this job. But what's interesting is that God says to him in verse 7 of chapter 1, Yahweh said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. It's not like Jeremiah had to make this up. He didn't have to kind of craft this all. His job was to speak what God told him. And so God says, you're up for this challenge. Because it's not your words, Jeremiah. It's mine. That's what you've got to do. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith Yahweh. And Yahweh put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Yahweh said to me, behold, I have put my, my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee this day um, over the nations, the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. So this is the commission of the prophet. He was to take God's word, and with that word, he was to be a witness to the nations. It's not about age. It's not about prestige. It's not about your place in the nation. It's about speaking what God commands. He didn't make it up. It wasn't his opinion, what he thought. Rather, it was God's words that were in his mouth. It wasn't his feelings. It was God's communication to Israel. And that's why Jeremiah could stand there and speak with confidence, because he wasn't speaking his own words. He was speaking God's. And we can speak with confidence when we speak God's words and not our own. Now come over to the New Testament now, because Paul kind of says the same thing to Timothy. If, you, if you're not feeling up to the job, Timothy, he says, don't worry about it. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, he says, let no man despise your youth, but be an example of the believers in word in conversation or lifestyle, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So don't worry about your age, Timothy. Get on with the job. Be an example in the word, in what you say. But as we looked at yesterday, not just in word, but in deed, in what you do. And he goes on to say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. You're going to go through persecution. That's okay. But do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. So that's what Jeremiah is supposed to do. That's what Timothy's supposed to do. And young people, that is the commission that we have before us as well. So going back to Jeremiah in chapter 35, it's an interesting story because it was a doomed to failure from the start. It's kind of one of those things where, you know, you look at Jeremiah's life and you think, man, how did he kind of get up day by day and say, okay, another, another great day um, back to prison I go because I'm going to speak God's word and they're going to toss me in, 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 the, uh, in the prison. But the point was, is that this is, this is a career of prophets, of speaking God's word no matter what the consequences. In Jeremiah chapter 35, God says to him, look, I've sent you unto all my servants the prophets, rising up early, or sent unto you, sorry, all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, return for every man from his evil way, Amend your doings. Don't go after other gods. And the consequence will be that you'll dwell in the land. So he, he sent them with a message to encourage them to, to never mind what the world's doing. Follow what God wants to do. Return back to him. And God says, look, I've sent you all my servants, the prophets. And they've risen up early. And, and, and they've been sent. They were early risers, young people. I mean, that's kind of tough for us sometimes. I, I get that. But like, you know, it's kind of a pattern in the scripture. Jeremiah uh, was an early riser. So was Abraham. Abraham rose up early in Genesis 22 and verse 3 to offer Isaac. Moses rose up early in Exodus 24 and verse 4. Joshua rose up early in Joshua 29 verse 20. And Hezekiah that we looked at yesterday rose up early when it came time to do the work that was assigned to them. Get on with the job because this is God's work. It's not our own. It's his work. And he expects us and looks to us to be involved in this process. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, as uh, we looked at yesterday, had the tongue of the learned in Isaiah 50, verse 4, that he should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He was woken, as we looked at, morning by morning. Um, and he learned, basically, when he wakened. His ear was basically to, to hear with the learned, as the learned. 
And so that's what we've got to do is we've got to wake ourselves up with the word of God so that then it sets the course for our day. And, and as you get started out in life, especially the young couples, if you can do a reading in the first thing in the morning, it's the best time to do it. That's when our brains are awake and they're active and they're alive. Get God's word in first before we worry about all the, the hustle and bustle of the day. Because then what can happen is, is then our outlook on the day changes. We're thinking about the kingdom to come. And all this stuff that happens in the meantime is just inconsequential. So we've got to get our minds into the word of God. He was to speak a word in season to him that was weary. To speak the word when it needed to be spoken. And we look at the prophets. They were men who spoke words of comfort to people as well as words of warning. They were also men of prayer. If we look at Elijah, he was a man of prayer. James tells in chapter 5 and verse 16, the prayer of the righteous person is of great power as, is, as it is working. Elijah is a man with a nature just like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So we can see there how that God basically uh, worked through Elijah and answered his prayer. Prophets are also men of action. Jeremiah was told, gird up your loins, arise and speak to them, all that I command thee. Don't be dismayed. So, so get on with the job. Be ready for action. Girding up the loins is that process of gathering the, the long garments and tying them up into your belt so that your legs are free so that you can run and you wouldn't fall over the skirts, right? So that's what Jeremiah had to do was, was to gird up his loins and, and to go out and to speak the word of truth. And that's the the job of a prophet is to engage people to the point that they'll get active. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2 said, look, this vision that I'm giving you, Habakkuk, as a prophet, he says, I want you to make it plain, write it out plainly for people. Why? So that he that may run that reads it. So it's a call to action. That's what prophets are there for, is to call people to action. And of course, we know uh, Elijah was this exact man of action because, of course, he ran uh, as an older man before the chariot of Ahab um, and beat Ahab in his chariot with horses on his way down to Jezreel. He was a man of action. We are also to be people of action. We read that the Lord says to us in, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and yourselves as unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, he may, they may open to him immediately. And we talked about that yesterday. Where will we be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns? You know, when he shows up, when the angel comes to, to gather us together, are we going to be with our loins girded? You know, it's citing back really to the Passover, right? How they were to eat with their staff in their hands, their shoes on their feet, and their loins girded. They had to be ready to go. And young people and brothers and sisters, we have to be ready to go. That is one of the jobs of the prophets. And that, of course, is what Peter tells us, to gird up the loins of our minds so that we can be absolutely ready when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Now, another prophet was Ezekiel. We have a fair amount of detail about Ezekiel as well. In Ezekiel, um, his commission was kind of a tough one. Ezekiel chapter 2, he's told here in verse 3, I send you to the children of Israel. What kind of people are they? Well, they're a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even to this very day. They are impudent children and stiff-necked. I do send you to them, and thou shalt say to them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh. And whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are rebellious to the house, shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Now, how'd you like that job? You know, I'm going to send you to this ecclesia, and you're going to have to go speak to this ecclesia and not going to listen to the words you're going to say. They're stiff-necked and they're rebellious. And he says it's not the point. The point is that they're going to know that when this comes to pass, there's a prophet amongst them. Whether they will hear or forbear, whether they'll listen or not, is irrelevant. The job was to be a witness. And that sometimes is what we have to be, is a witness. Sometimes it's to the world around. Sometimes it's to our brothers and sisters. Whether they're going to listen or not really doesn't matter. Because it's not my opinion or your opinion that we're supposed to be talking about anyway. It's God's opinion. And so he goes on to say, look, son of man, he says, I'm going to send you to the house of Israel, speak my words unto them, but they're not going to listen to you um, because they don't listen to me. So he says, why are they going to listen to you? 
For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, as an adamant, uh, a flint, has I, have I made your forehead. So don't be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So God says, look, I'm going to strengthen you for this job. I'm going to equip you for this job, but it's not going to be an easy job. They're not going to listen to you. But what you've got to do is never mind. Don't fear. And that tells you something, young people. The prophets feared. Jeremiah feared. Ezekiel's told, don't be afraid, which means he was afraid. Uh, Elijah was afraid of Jezebel and ran for his life. I mean, this wasn't like, they weren't like people who had no fear whatsoever. They were terrified at times. But they trusted in their God that he would deliver them. And so this is what Ezekiel had to do. But it's interesting, again, like he was involved in this message. In verse 10 of chapter 3, Moreover he said to me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears. And go, get thee to them of the captivity, to the children of thy people, and speak them and tell them. Speak unto them and tell them. Thus saith Yahweh, whether they're here or not. But notice the process there. He had to take the word of God into his heart first. He had to accept it. Then he had to go out and speak it. Because if he believed it, it made him a much more credible witness to the people around. And that's the commission to us. We have to take God's word into our hearts first. We have to respond to its message. And then we have to get about sharing it with others. Now, it wasn't just the prophets in the time of Israel's uh, captivity or leading up to it that, that were facing this kind of a problem. Think about the disciples. Come over to Matthew because the Lord Jesus Christ says to the disciples, look, Guys, I've got an assignment for you, but it's a tough mission because they're not all going to listen to you. And in John chapter 10, or Matthew, sorry, chapter 10, verse 14, he says, look, whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, then depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. But that tells you that when the, the apostles and the disciples went out, there were going to be people who didn't listen to them. They're just not going to listen to what they have to say. It says, Verily I say unto you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now just kind of process that for a little bit. More tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for this city? Uh, we've actually been to the city of Sodom, and we've seen the meter of ash and the skeletons basically at the bottom of it, where basically it was all just absolutely obliterated. And it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah from those who don't listen to the word of God that came at the mouth of the apostles as they went out with those miracles to raise the dead and heal the sick and so on and so forth. And the Lord goes on to say in verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So don't be stupid, he says. Don't just kind of go out there ridiculously. Think about what you're doing. Beware of men. for They will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony, a witness against them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't take any thought for what you're going to answer, for it will be given you at the same hour what you shall speak. They were God's messengers, and their job was to be a witness. And that's part of what we do. That's why we sometimes call it a public witness. We are to witness to the world around us what God's will and message is. It doesn't mean that they always listen. And when we give a public lecture, down at a, a hired hall or something like that, people come out, but they don't always respond to that message. But we have done our job in being a witness. But it doesn't mean because they don't respond, we don't keep witnessing. That was the job of the prophets. And the Lord Jesus Christ said too, look, don't be a martyr. Uh, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. Fear not, therefore, for you are more valued than many sparrows. He's talking about the sparrows falling to the ground. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you deny me, he says, I will deny you before my Father in heaven, too. So he says, don't look for persecution. We're not out there to get persecuted. That's not the goal. The goal is to speak the message. And if you get persecution, leave that place, go to a different one. But it was a formidable task. They had to confess his name before men. And, you know, if they didn't confess it, then the Lord says, I will not confess you before my father. 
But he told them, you know, in, in some of his parables and the things that he talked about in, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 20, or 37, he said that Jerusalem was a city that killed the prophets and stoned them that are sent to them. How often he says, what I have gathered you together. So potentially, they would be killed. We don't face that kind of persecution, young people. We don't have this kind of resistance. But do we actually preach? Do we get out there and speak the word of God? Are, are you willing to go out and, and distribute leaflets or something like that when there's going to be a, a, a study day, or not a study day, but a public lecture series or a seminar series or whatever else? Or are we embarrassed to kind of go and stick them in the doors of people that might know us at school? I mean, we all go through this as young people growing up. You still have it at work. You know, people ask you, what did you do on the weekend? We could tell them, I went to a Bible study weekend. What? And then they'll ask you about it. Or you can just say, oh, I went to visit friends, you know. And you can kind of deny and not actually say what you've really been about. But we're more, the persecution we'll face is probably more likely just ridiculous. What's more likely to kill us is the lust of other things, those, those thorns, right? The smothering attractions of the world that choke those that, that are um, not grounded in the word if we let those things grow up and, and, and smother us. Now, it's interesting because the Lord Jesus Christ He's the king and the priest, right? We talk about the Melchizedek priesthood. But the reason we've thrown this in here, in the section on prophets, is because he also is the prophet. If you come back to Deuteronomy, Moses tells the children of Israel, look, not only does he prophesy about a king and a priest that's going to come, but in chapter 18, he says, look, Yahweh thy God will raise up unto you a prophet from amidst of, of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall you hearken. I will raise them up a prophet, he goes into saying, verse 18, from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak unto them all that I shall command to him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Notice the common theme that we look at prophets. They were to speak God's words. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He was the absolute prophet. He was the one that was to come. But if we don't respond to his words, God says, I will require it of us. Every single one of us, baptized or not, if we don't re require, respond to his words, it will be required of us. But this was the job of the prophets, to go out and to speak. And in Isaiah chapter 61, we read here about a, a messianic prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit of, of uh, Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh hath appoint, anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified. You see, this was the message the Lord was to speak. And you notice there's two sides to it. There is basically to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh, which is also the day of vengeance. Because it's acceptable to Israel, there's a, there's a kingdom coming, where they're going to be restored once again, a restoration of the kingdom to Israel. They're going to be cleansed and they're going to be saved. But to the nations, it's a day of vengeance, a day when God will come to wreak vengeance upon those who will come against his people of Israel. Now, the message they bring is an incredible message. In Isaiah 52, in verse 7, we read that it's not just Messiah that is preaching this good news. But he says there, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good things, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up their voice, with the, with the voice together they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when Yahweh shall bring again to Zion. So we have the feet of him that preaches the gospel of peace, and this is taken by the Apostle Paul and is an expanded out. It's not just the Messiah that has to do this. It's also other people. You see, God requires prophets to fulfill his purpose. Let's just come over to Romans chapter 10. There's a logic to this. 
We talk about the purpose of God being to fill the earth with the knowledge of his character as the waters cover the sea, right? He wants us to project his character to all the people around and teach them about it so that they will respond. And so we have in Romans chapter 10, this section where Paul quotes Isaiah 52. And he says, the scripture saith, whosoever hath believed on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek, it doesn't matter if you're preaching to Jews or, or to Gentiles, for it's the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that includes us, but it's also the people that we speak to. But then Paul makes this comment, well, how are people going to call on somebody who they haven't believed in? Or how are they going to believe on somebody that they've not heard about? Or how are they going to hear about somebody if there is no preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, which is what the prophets and apostles were. And as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. So the Lord's commission, the messianic psalm about Jesus, is now extended to us that we're supposed to be doing the same thing. We're supposed to be holding forth the word of life. The only way that we can mess up preaching is by not preaching. Because it's God that does the calling. As a young person, I used to think, oh, I'm really nervous. You know, I, I might not say the right thing, so I'll just close my mouth and not say anything. Well, that's like, remember the parable of the talents and the one who took his one talent and he wrapped it in a napkin and he hid it in the ground because he was afraid. Well, we can't do that, young people. We've got to take and share the hope, share what God has given us. And don't be afraid. God is the one who calls. You know, he, he can use us as the tools to do it, but if we won't do it, he'll find somebody else. But it's him that gives the increase. And we're not going to blow it. You know, it's not like we say, okay, well, we didn't say the right thing, so that person's never coming to the truth. It's not going to happen. I mean, he's not willing that anybody should perish. If God has called somebody, and you're the mechanism through which their a response is invoked, and we kind of get it a little bit wrong, he's going to maybe assign somebody else to help. I mean, he even did this with the angels. Remember Gabriel says to Daniel, look, the prince of Persia withstood me one in 20 days, and so Michael was sent to help me out. God may send others to help us out. We might call a friend, call a lifeline, get somebody else to help us out in preaching, but the only way we can mess it up is to not speak. But what we will be responsible for is the people that we don't speak to. If we speak the truth to somebody and they don't respond, well, it's on their own head. But if we know the truth and we don't tell somebody, that's on our head. I mean, think about this. Get to the kingdom age, you know. Fire and brimstone's going down all over the place. There's earthquakes. There's all those things we talked about. And you actually meet in the street somebody you went to school with. And they're like, whoa, dude, what's with the white clothes? You know, and you're like, well, you know, I'm actually one of the Lord Jesus Christ's immortal saints. I'm here to kind of obliterate this place. Maybe not that that's the point. But you know what I mean? Like, so, so, and he says, well, what do you mean? You're, you're, you're a saint? What, what's this? How come you never told me about this? How come you never told, I mean, we went to school together. Like, we sat by each other in math class or history class or whatever it was. I've known you since we were in kindergarten. How come you've never told me any of this? And how would we feel, young people? Because we're supposed to be the lights to the world. How would we feel at work when the person sitting beside us that we worked with all those years, and all of a sudden the kingdom's coming and, you know, all this great distress on nations is going to be there. And we're like, woohoo, we're out of here. You know, and they're like, well, hold on a minute here. You know, how come you're all excited? Well, because the kingdom's here. Well, what, were you going to tell me about this? I mean, we're, the only way we can mess it up is not to be the ones who speak. But when we do speak, we have to make sure that what we speak is not what's in our heart. You know, just look at this. This is in Ezekiel chapter 13. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel. So there was two types of prophets. There's, there's the Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah type of prophet. Then these other ones, these prophets of Israel that prophesy out of their own heart. Hear ye the word of Yahweh. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, woe to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit, but they've seen nothing. You see, our heart, we're told in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. You don't want to follow your own heart. That would be like a lemming going right off a cliff, right? That's the way it's going to go for you if you follow your own heart. Isaiah 55, we looked at it yesterday, told us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. So 
when we speak, it has to be God's word. It cannot be our own word. And he says this over and over again. Like look at Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16. Hearken not to the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you and make you vain. They make you vain. They speak a vision out of their own heart and not out of the mouth of Yahweh. They say still unto them that despise me, well, Yahweh has said, you will have peace. And they say unto everyone that walking after the imagination of his own heart, oh, no evil is going to come upon him. This is the message of the world. Even Adolf Hitler got sent to heaven, by the way. His eulogy given by a Catholic priest was that he was going to heaven. I mean, can you imagine? Like, but that's what the world says. Oh, you know, you're good. You know, say a few Hail Marys and we'll get you out of this. And, you know, you can go straight up to heaven. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 bucks. You know, it's like, it's just this instant sort of ratification thing. God says, we're not to be that way. And we're not to be that way to one another either. We have to speak the truth. The Proverbs tells us that, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So the lesson for us is, when it comes to prophesying, when it comes to speaking the truth, don't use the scientific method. Now, the scientific method is you have a, a theory, a hypothesis that you come up with. And then you set out to find facts to prove it. And if we do that in the Bible, this is a disaster. Where we come up with, I have, an, I, I have a great idea. Let me go see if I can find a few passages to substantiate my great idea. That's prophesying out of our own hearts. We come up with an idea, and then we go look at a smattering of verses to try and, oh yeah, you could use this verse and this one here if you kind of twist it a little bit or ignore the last part, the next verse or whatever. Take it out of context. We can, we can sew all these things together. That's not the way prophets were supposed to be. Do not use the scientific method. Come up with a theory and find verses to prove it. Instead, use God's method. Use the spiritual method. Let God speak to you through his word. Gather his thoughts. Write down the principles and the facts that he shares with us. And then basically build our conclusions on top of them and recount them to other people. That is what being a faithful prophet is all about. See, the problem with the people of Israel at this time was so the prophets is they prophesied lies in his name, we're told in Jeremiah 23 through 25. And what this did was they caused my people to forget my name by their dreams. So they came up with all these crazy ideas and all these, you know, theories and possibilities and speculations that they thought were kind of cool. They couldn't substantiate them with the scriptures. And what they did was they made the people forget God. Because instead of speaking to him the truth, they spoke to him their own theories. And that's what we can sometimes do if we get too far into speculation. We don't want the husks. We don't want, you know, like a husk is, a piece of wheat. There's the, the little grain of wheat. Now, that's you can make bread out of that, right? But surrounding the grain of wheat, there's this husk. And it's got no nutritional value. You don't eat the husk. It's like banana peel. I suppose somebody somewhere making some green smoothie would use a banana peel. But, but generally speaking, like, you know, you don't eat the banana peels. You eat the bananas. And that's what the, the prophets here are supposed to be doing, is giving them the true food and not the, the pseudo food from around, like McDonald's. But like, so here you have it. He says, he that speaks my, speak, uh, hath, um, let me read the passage. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my words faithfully. Because he says, what does the chaff to do with the wheat? Right? Like, come on. He says, like, what? there's chaff and there's wheat. Let him speak my word faithfully. That's like the wheat. It's got nutritional value. The chaff is nothing. So that's what we've got to do. We have to be truth prophets and speak God's word. And this is really the, the, the point of Isaiah um, 8 and verse 19 to 20. We don't go to the familiar wizards and, and spirits that peep and mutter. So, you know, Harry Potter, he's out as far as this goes. Um, Should not a people seek to their God for the living to the dead? The law and to the testimony. That's where we're supposed to go. So the law and to the testimony, the word of God. If we don't speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in it. If, if that's the way we are as prophets, we don't speak chapter and verse, this is what God wants us to say, then there is no light in us. And God warns us not to be naive. In our day and age, we say, oh, that was Israel years ago, and they had all these false prophets and idols and whatever. Well, look, this is what Peter says. Look, he says, there were false prophets among the people in, in 2 Peter 2, verse 1, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in damnable destruction or heresies and denying the master that bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And they're going to be effective 
because many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. Young people, sometimes people stand up amongst us and say things that we all want to hear. You know, we all we just want to hear that. It's pleasing. But it's not what God has to say. And we've got to beware of that. To the law and to the testimony. And as a caution, young people and brothers and sisters, do not be surprised when things go amok in the ecclesia. It will happen. It's, it's just a matter of time. Because what God has done is brought together a group of people that are all inflicted with the same disease called human nature. Every single one of us has it. Never judge the truth by the people. Because the people will always fail you. I remember Brother Harry Tennant, the young people's uh, weekend that we went to, saying to us young people, look, he says, if you judge the truth by me, you won't be in the truth because I will let you down. I'm flesh. And that's the truth. We will let one another down. Your moms, your dads, your uncles, your aunts will let you down. Brothers and sisters will let you down because we're all made of the same stuff. We don't judge the truth by the people. We judge the truth by putting our trust in our God. And when things go wrong, when ecclesial difficulties come, when there's, there's controversy in our ecclesias, we don't allow ourselves to say, well, that's it, I'm packing it up. I'm, I'm, you know, these guys obviously don't know what they're doing. Well, they do know what they're doing. They're doing the wrong thing sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, and that sometimes happens. But we can't judge the truth by that. We have to judge the truth. It's right in the, in the Psalms. God tells us, you know, put not your trust in princes, in, the, in, in those who, who basically have breath in their lungs. Put your trust in me. And that's what we've got to do. So when it comes to figuring out the right way, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Jews uh, who were in Thessalonica or in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Many, therefore, believed. And there were, there were Greek women um, of high standing as well as men. Right? So that's what he says. Look, Paul... And the message he was given was vetted against the scriptures. To the law and to the testament. Could they prove it out of the Bible? And they did that with him. We need to do it with each other. We certainly need to do it with me. Whatever you do, don't just glibly accept everything. Check it out. Look it up. Write damn passages and see what they say. And we don't give room to it. Don't give false teaching a platform. There were false brethren brought in unawares who came in privily, says Paul in Galatians, to spy out your liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring you into bondage. To whom, he says, we didn't give them a Bible class. We gave them place by subjection, not for one hour. Why? Well, that the truth of the gospel might continue. Now, that's not exactly um, the humanistic, everybody gets their say kind of motto of today. I mean, we sort of are, are steeped in French Revolution thinking, liberty, equality, fraternity, everybody's word is equally as valid, etc., etc. No, it's not. My word isn't valid at all. Neither is yours. Your opinion shouldn't matter one thing, and neither should mine. What matters is what does God say? Chapter and verse, what does God have to say to the law and to the testimony? And so Paul says, we're not going to give this false teaching a place so that the truth of the gospel might continue. Now, brothers and sisters and young people, you know, I might seem a little kind of harsh, but it's worth it. You know, the, the persecution the prophets went through, it's absolutely worth it. Paul says, therefore, endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain this, uh, the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, uh, which in Christ Jesus with eternal uh, glory. It is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he, can, he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And so, young people, we have this, is that it, is worth enduring for the sake of our brothers and sisters. Notice that. He's not saying I endure all things for my own sake. He says I endure all things that they, for the elect's sake, that they may obtain salvation. That was his goal, is the saving of others. And he says, now if I die in that process, I'll be raised. If I suffer, I'll reign with him as a king and a priest. Just as a footnote, by the way, I have special thanks to Phoebe because she did all the drawings for me for this, this class. Revelation chapter 3, or 20, sorry, and verse 3, we, or verse 4, the Lord tells us this, or John in his vision says, I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, 
Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. To envision, he saw people, prophets, priests, uh, disciples who lost their lives. But he's seeing the end picture. And the end picture is, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the goal, brothers and sisters, is that we live and reign with Christ. And never mind the troubles that we may go through now. We have to be like Daniel, who started out as a young man in Babylon, where he was basically taken as a captive against his will. And we read right at the beginning in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's portion of, the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And that's what we have to do, purpose in our hearts not to defile ourselves, but to make our vessels fit and usable to God for future kings, priests, and as prophets. Now, Daniel did that for his entire life, as we mentioned last night in our discussion. You know, he's 80 years old when his final trial comes upon him. He continues, and he's actually 87, possibly 90 years old if you do the math. That's when he faces the lion's den. I mean, quite often in Sunday school drawings, he's depicted as about 40 years old. This was the way end of his life. So if you think, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, uh, we're, we're through, young people, that, oh, you get to your, your 80s and it's all smooth sailing from there, that's usually when they bring the lions out, you know? So just don't think that it, it's going to just go away. But Daniel was taken up out of the den. Why? No manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And young people, we can be delivered out of whatever it might be if we believe in our, in our God. And Daniel, at the end of this trial, in chapter 12, and at verse 13, is told, Go your way, Daniel. Thou shalt rest. He says, you're, you're going to die. You're going to fall asleep in the Lord. But you're going to be allowed to stand. Um, you're going to stand in thy allowed place, in your lot, as the ESV puts it, the allowed place at the end of days. Do you remember that verse we looked at yesterday? Do you remember Zechariah? What did he say? If you walk in my ways and you keep my charge, thou shalt also judge my house. Thou shalt keep my courts, and I will give you places to walk amongst these that stand by. Daniel's promised exactly the same thing as Joshua is in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 12. And we are promised the same thing. If we stay true, then God will look after us and he will bring us through to the kingdom of God. But we've got a job to do. And it's up to us if we accept that commission or not to be kings and priests and prophets in the kingdom of God. To send out that message, to join in. In Revelation chapter 14, there's, that, there's the everlasting gospel that's spoken to all nations. If we want to be involved in that now, we must be doing it. We must be doing it now if we want to be involved in it in the future. We have to be apprenticing as kings, taking our Bibles, reading them every day, studying them, writing stuff out, so that basically we know how to give a word in season. We know how to make righteous judgment. When a problem comes up in the ecclesia, what are we going to do? We can say, well, this is what it says in Isaiah chapter 37, verse whatever it might be. This is what it says in, in Acts chapter 3. This is what they did. Let's do what God tells us to do, not what we think or what you think. When it comes time to be priests, to work, within the ecclesia, offering ourselves as living sacrifices to help other people get there. Remember, Paul, what is my joy? What is my crown of rejoicing? What was this, the thing that he looked forward to was you in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way we need to look at it. with each other. It's not about me getting into the kingdom. It's not about you getting into that kingdom. It's about you helping everybody around you getting into the kingdom. That's the goal. That's the crown of rejoicing. That's what we've got to be all about. Because that's God's why, right? To fill the earth with people who have his character. And as Gideon and I were talking about yesterday, what is that character summed up in? God is love. And so we have to have that self-sacrificing love that we show one to another. To put everybody else first and get them to the kingdom. Not demanding our rights by any stretch of the imagination, but doing what is right in his eyes. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where God kind of rolls this thing all together. Well, Paul does. He says, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And he has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
Remember we talked about that yesterday? What is God's glory? You know, it's his character. Well, he was going to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's, it's shown, or shown, I guess you could say, in the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the character of God. And what did he do? He gave his life for us. But we, he says, we've got that treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. We can't lift up ourselves. Remember what the king was told? Don't be arrogant. Don't be lifted up above your brethren. We are troubled on every side. But we're not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. It doesn't matter what happens when we go out there and speak the word, whether it's to each other, to our brothers and sisters, to the world around us, God's going to bring us through. We're always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord. And just one second here, that the life. Sorry. There we go. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus Christ might be made manifest in our body. Right, so we see the two things go side by side. That's the bread and the wine we're going to talk about shortly. The dying of the Lord Jesus Christ is the bread, putting to death, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. That the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And that life was shown in the things that he did. And that's what God wants for his kingdom, is those characteristics. So, brothers and sisters and young people, as we come to a, a conclusion of our thoughts together, and we'll continue on with our exhortation, but... Really, the question is, like, that's what God's doing. He's filling the earth with a people who show his character, who show his love, his mercy, his truth, his justice, all those things all pulled together in that, at that characteristic of love. All those things that are all centered in that, and he wants to share that with you and I so that we become vessels that hold that and that we also manifest it in our bodies the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask the question then, at the end of all this, what is our why? What is it that we are hoping to do in our lives? Where is it, brothers and sisters, that we want to be? And so we have to decide that for ourselves. I can't decide for you. You can't decide for me. But we decide it each and every day. Do we want to be kings and priests? Do we want to reign with him for a thousand years? Do we want to take up that great offer that he, he has given to us? Every single one of us makes that answer now.